you everyone for coming. So, so my name is Jonathan Pallant, the J Pster in internet circles or the real J Pster on Twitter because I came to that late. Um, and this is my talk about, uh, you can have various titles. It says here, writing a single tasking DOS for ARM. Um, you might also call it, what is an operating system? Why do they exist? And why has this fool tried to write another one? Um, so I'm an embedded systems engineer, I guess, by trade. That's what my degree was in. Uh, these days, I specialize in the Rust programming language. I work at a company called Ferris Systems. They're based out of Berlin. I don't have to commute. I can work from home. Um, and I teach and consult in Rust. But my background has been C, C++, Python, Pascal. Did some Modular 2 back in the day. Uh, obviously started with Basic, as most people of my generation did. Um, most of the work I do, pretty much all the work I do is open source. So, you know, some links you can um, find me on GitHub, say find me on Twitter where I talk about random old junk I've collected from Free Stuff Fridays out the front here and desperate attempts to make it work. Um, and everything we're talking about today is on GitHub at Neotron Compute. So you can go there and check it all out. Um, and we, we, slides are available on the GitHub as well. So you'll be able to go through and find those. So this is a talk in four parts. We're going to talk about what is an operating system. It's kind of a, uh, maybe a common term, but maybe we don't think so much these days about what it means, what an operating system does for us. Why do we need one? So we'll talk about that first. And then it, I think it'd be interesting, look, a romp through the history of the operating system. There have been many. We will not cover most of them. I've picked out, I think, a few interesting ones. It'll be interesting to look at some of the museum folk. Maybe you've got some examples of these kicking around out the back. We talked about what the operating system means today, where we are in modern terms, in terms of operating systems, such as on this Apple laptop. And then finally, we'll talk about the one I'm trying to write and the project that's sort of grown up around that, which is called Neotron. Um, those of you who saw previous talk, that was a demo system I built and that was called the Monotron. It was originally because it only had one color. Um, and this is sort of like the next generation of that project. So, it's various terms, uh, technical terms in this talk. So I think it's useful to get some clarification up front. So, OS, I mean operating system. And when I say a DOS, DOS, I mean a disk operating system in the generic sense. I'm not referring to Microsoft DOS, which I consider to be a specific example of a disk operating system. But as we will see, there were other operating systems from, from other suppliers, completely incompatible, completely different. So when I say DOS, I don't mean a DOS as you would see on a PC, just a generic operating system that basically does stuff with disks. Really, I consider these terms to be interchangeable certainly aren't many operating systems around now that don't know the concept of a disk. So I probably use these terms interchangeably in here. We may also talk about a real-time operating system and RTOS. I consider that to be quite a different thing. And there we get into a discussion around what is a computer and what is an embedded system. So for me, the distinction is fairly straightforward. It's a question of, can I walk up to the machine and command it to do things the designer, the author, the manufacturer did not anticipate or intend. I would say a BBC Micro, I absolutely can. I can walk up, I can type a basic program into it and get it to do all kinds of things. Um, an Arduino, if an Arduino is laying on the desk, if I walk up to it, I don't think I can command it to do anything because it doesn't have a screen or a keyboard, how would I speak to it? I would have to bring another computer with me. And I think once you've brought another computer along and plugged it in, that suggests the thing you've plugged in is probably not a computer in its own right. It's an embedded system. And you can get into long conversations, probably best saved for down the bar as to things like a Raspberry Pi. Is it an embedded system? I would suggest it probably depends where it's been installed. If it's on a kid's desk with a keyboard and a monitor, I would say, no, that's a computer. If it's baked into a ticket machine in a railway station, I would say at that point probably is an embedded system because I can't walk up to the ticket machine and play Minesweeper on it. So let's talk about what, a, what a, an operating system or what a DOS does. So I think there are four pieces to this. And the first of these is it runs applications. 
Now prepare to be bowled away by the quality of the graphics I've included in this presentation, but I will warn you, I hand drew the SVG. And when I say hand drew, I mean basically hand typed. So boxes are about as fancy as we're gonna get, I'm afraid. So what is an application? Well, it's sort of this nebulous thing, right? It exists and we can point to it and say, Microsoft Word, that's an application. And we consider that to be distinct from Microsoft Excel or Paint or whatever else. I think primarily you define an application in terms of its input and its output. That's really all it is. It's a, it's a machine or a system that takes input and produces output. And then it may have some temporary or maybe even permanent storage, which is sort of a combination of input and output. You can output it and then get it as input later. You save your Word document. That's output, goes to the disk system. Later on, you load your Word document. That becomes input. The input normally would might be typing on the keyboard, so keyboard events saying which characters have been pressed. The job of the application is to process that input and the output may be graphics on your screen so you can see the document you're working on. But I think we can think of pretty much all applications in terms of it's a box, there's some input and there's some output. And that's really as much detail as we need when we talk about what is, a, what is an operating system doing. Of course, in the past, your input to output pipeline may have been a lot more straightforward. It may have been, there's the paper tape reader and you know, there is new punch tape that comes on the output. And it's quite simply, there's input, work happens in the middle, and there's output. So we have applications and they process input and output. And I think the next thing to talk about is it runs on a computer, which leads to the natural question, what is a computer? Interesting question to ask in the center for computing history. I, to me, and there's maybe lots of definitions on this, to me, a computer is defined by having a central processing unit which executes instructions and maybe has some registers. So these instructions can store data and get data back later. And I think a computer also needs to have memory. And that memory we can think of as the, the gym lockers at your local sports center, right? There's just a bunch of storage places and each one has a number. And I can find the numbered one, I can put stuff in there, and then later on I can go and fetch the stuff back again. Sometimes memory is volatile, that is when we pull the power from the computer, the contents of all of these boxes will fade away. Sometimes very quickly, sometimes if you've got a can of freezer spray, actually you can steal the memory dim out of a laptop and it'll live for maybe 20 seconds or so while you quickly plug it into another one. But generally, volatile memory fades away. Non-volatile memory, I think this is actually just a question of time scales. Non-volatile memory, we think the contents of these boxes will live for hopefully years. Write it to a hard disk, write it to some flash memory. It should definitely last some number of years. I'm sure we can talk to the archive team here and go, what about a 20 year old floppy disk? 30 year old floppy disk? Has the, has the data become volatile at that point? Is it, is it no longer readable? But for our purposes, a computer has a central processing unit and it has some memory and the memory has uh, numeric addresses to access all of the pieces of memory. Finally, we, we talked applications need input and output. So our computer needs some kind of input and output. Now, very often these input and output devices pretend to be memory. So the computer, the application that's running believes it is just writing to some, some memory addresses, but actually this isn't real memory. This is almost like you open the gym locker and you put some data inside and then a pixie immediately comes along and takes it out and does something with it. Store, writes it down on a piece of paper or whatever. I have no idea it's being written down on a piece of paper. It's just my job to, to put it in the locker. Someone else is taking it, writing it out. That's often how uh, input output devices work. They don't have to. Sometimes you have specific instructions in your central processing unit for um, inputting and outputting data. Typical input output devices we might think about, displays, projectors, TVs, that kind of thing. Keyboards, still very popular for inputting data. Um, storage devices, hard disks have gone away these days. This laptop certainly doesn't have a spinning, uh, you know, iron disk inside it. It's just got flash memory, little transistors in arrangements that can lock themselves into a certain state. And then communications, you know, what is a modern computer without the ability to talk to the internet or to at least talk to other computers? So there's a sort of a key input output um, as well.
Um, your computer will require some amount of uh, non-volatile memory um, because it needs to know what to do when you switch it on. If all of your memory is volatile, then you're back to, uh, I guess, the Altair. Maybe the, maybe the Imzai, I don't know if that has a boot ROM in it, where you've actually got to flip switches on the front to put in the first couple of instructions to, uh, to get the machine to start. So pretty much all computers will have some non-volatile memory. So an example, uh, this picture is taken from uh, Flickr. Uh, IBM System 360 Model 30. I'm pretty sure it's a Model 30. There might be some people in the audience going, that's not a 30, that's definitely a 45. Uh, this machine, I believe, was launched in 1965. You've got 64 kilobytes of memory, 8-bit wide. Uh, it's microcoded, so although it runs at 1 megahertz, you only get 35,000 operations per second. Accessing a register takes eight clock cycles. So it's definitely not fast, but, you know, compared to running the payroll by hand with a, with a pen and pencil, you know, it's not too bad. The notes on, uh, that came with it said it had two five megabyte magnetic disk drives. I think based on the picture, probably suspect there are three. Um, I don't know why two of them are cream and one of them is yellow. Don't claim to be an expert. I think at the front, that's probably a teletype for your input and output. We'll talk about where teletypes ended up and the history of Unix and things like that later. Something like this would have set you back in its basic version about $130,000. So in the 60s, computers were big and they were expensive. I think there's also some tape loops uh, over on the far left. Another IBM machine, probably got several of these kicking around here, the original PC5150. This picture's from Wikimedia. So we've moved on maybe only 15, 17 years. We've gone from 1965 to 1982. It's not a huge leap in time really, but now we're at 4.77 megahertz. Still got 64K of RAM. We now have floppy drives rather than those big hard disk drives. Um, which operating system did the IBM PC 5150 ship with out of the box? If you didn't put a floppy disk in it, what would you get? Basic, yep. They all shipped with Microsoft Basic in ROM. I think it was gone by the time you got to the XT. It also has a connector on the back for plugging in a tape deck. So you can load and save your basic programs from cassette tape. The IBM PC really was an early 80s home computer. We forget about that now because it sort of evolved and moved on and we think more about sort of the, the later machines. But, you know, this is a machine with basic in ROM and a cassette interface. Unambiguously a computer though. What about this then? The Raspberry Pi Pico. So now we've jumped forward 30 years. IBM PC was probably four or five thousand dollars I would have thought new. This board, four dollars. 133 megahertz, two processors, two 32-bit processors, and we've got 256k of RAM. So we've got four times the RAM of the PC, we've got you know, at least a hundred times the performance. Um, this board costs four dollars. I mean, it's effectively disposable. They just, they cost absolutely, the chip, the main processing chip on there is 75 cents. And um, with to that, you'll need to add about 20, 30 cents of um, flash memory to store your code. Is it a computer? Probably not in the format it's in because there's no input and output. How do I get data into and out of my system? But I think you can turn it into a computer. So what does a DOS do? Well, it runs applications and it runs on a computer for some value of computer. Um, the disk, the D in DOS uh, means we have to manage files on a disk of some kind. So for those who've not looked into the intricacies of how data was stored on spinning magnetic media, the disk is broken down like this. So you can think of this as being like the, the, the brown circle inside your floppy disk if you've ever peeled one apart. You've probably then failed to put it back together again. If you took a hard drive apart, you would see a similar thing. It's a, a circle of uh, ferrous material where we can store data magnetically. 
It's split into rings, and those rings are called tracks. So A is an example of a track. When you've got multiple platters, you might consider all of the tracks, the, the same track on each, uh, in, on each platter together, or even each side. You might consider that to be a cylinder, right? Because if you just stack the circles up, you'd see that as a cylinder. And if you've dealt with old PCs, you might have heard PCs talk about cylinders, heads, and sectors. Really, they sort of mean tracks, heads. So you might have a reading head on the bottom and a reading head on the top of the disc, or it might be your discs are one-sided. Maybe you have to take the discs out and turn them over. Cylinders, heads, and sectors. Sector is a mathematical term, and they mean the, the section shaded blue. That is the sector of a circle. Computer people are annoying. When they say sector, they mean sort of the intersection of a sector and a track. So it's that small piece of a track. Tracks are made of sectors. In this case, we've got what was that about eight, I think it's eight sectors to a track. And then operating system also think in terms of clusters. So each sector, so each piece of a track is only going to store 512 bytes. It's not a lot. Our files are probably going to be bigger than that. We tra keep track of all of the sectors on a disk. There might be a lot. That starts to be a lot of things to, to look after. So your operating system will normally clump your sectors together into what it calls a cluster. And so you'd have multiple clusters. Uh, sorry, a file will be stored in clusters, and each cluster is made of multiple sectors. But as long as I know what the starting sector is, I can work out the others because I know there's eight sectors to a cluster, whatever your operating system is decided. As long as I know where the first one is, I can find, I can go and find the rest. So an operating system has to manage this. When you say, I would like to read, readme.txt, you know, you use an interface like this. I want to go and read autoexec.bat. It's got to go, well, okay, where does that live? Well, then this idea of directories. Computers didn't always have the idea of directories and hierarchical files, um, certainly not originally. So it's got to go, what directory's in? Where does the directory start? There's the entry, find the entry for this file I want. What's the starting cluster? for that file, convert that into a, a track and a sector and a head, and now I can go and read the data. I have to keep track of how long the files are. Um, some operating systems do that to, to better granularity than others. Microsoft DOS that we see here stores the exact number of bytes in a file. Other operating systems might just track how many sectors there are, and your file just has some unused padding at the end got to keep track of time. People seem to like to know when the files were created, when they were perhaps when they were last modified as well. Um, Microsoft DOS, interestingly, because it doesn't have a lot of space to store this information, the timestamps are only accurate to the nearest two seconds. They didn't have enough bits to store it to the second, so it rounds it to the nearest, uh, the nearest two second interval. You then get into interesting games with backup programs where you've copied a file from a DOS formatted disk to somewhere else. Um, and you can get problems where the timestamps don't match because you've got this, this two-second granularity. But this is what a DOS is doing, right? It's dealing with disks. We don't have to think in terms of tracks and sectors and heads, and goodness, that would be tedious. We can think in terms of file names, and it's the operating system's job to go and arrange the data for us and fetch it back later without complaint and without corrupting it, mostly. Get the right bytes back in the right order is the trick. So I think the last thing we need to talk about in terms of what a DOS does is its ability to provide us portability. That is, we can take our applications and run them on different computers. It's a really useful thing, and it didn't always uh, exist. So let's imagine a world where there is no operating system, and the operating system is just part of the application. We don't distinguish them. There's just applications. There are computers, and we run apps on them. And so that must mean that the application is the thing that runs when you turn the computer on. And there are some systems like that. I believe you've got an Amstrad PCW in the museum. That really, if you run the um, design as a word processor, it runs LocaScript. There isn't really an operating system. It's sort of CPM, but the operating system and the word processor just exist as one on one disk. You put your start disk in, it loads up into LocoScript, the word processor. You can do your word processing. But in this world where there are no operating systems, there is just applications and they run on the computer. How do I run a different application? I mean, on a 
Amstrad PCW, really, you've got to take the disc out, reboot it, put a different one in. That gets pretty tedious pretty quickly. And then we ask the questions, okay, well, that Locus Script disc that definitely works in a, an Amstrad PCW, 8512 or whatever it is, but what if I want to run it on a different computer? Well, the problem is all the things that know about the computer I've baked into my application. So if I give it a completely different computer, my application is not going to know what to do. So we end up with thinking like, okay, well, we've got applications and we've got computers in this imaginary world where we pretend the operating system doesn't exist. And really very quickly, we could come to the conclusion that this world doesn't make sense. There has to be this layer in the middle where we take our applications and we pull out the bits that are computer specific and we just store them somewhere else. And that's really what we mean by an operating system. It is another piece of software and its job is to deal with the complexities of the computer and make them go away so that the people who write the applications don't have to think about the computer. They can just think about the operating system and the, the terms it provides. Um, you know, Microsoft Word does not have to worry itself about cylinders, heads and sectors. It can simply talk to the operating system and say, get me a file, save me a file, talk to the printer. And the operating system will, will deal with that for you, whether it's an IBM PC or, or something different. So that I think is a brief summary of what is a DOS or a, an operating system. Next, let's have a look at some operating systems from times past. Um, I think the earliest one I, the earliest one I could find, very happy to be uh, corrected in the questions afterwards. So remember this bit, see if you can think of some earlier examples. I think the Leo master program probably counts as one of the first um, operating systems. I'm not entirely sure though whether the Leo one ran a master program or if that was just applications running on bare metal. If only someone was busy archiving the Leo program and had all the documents to hand, we can, we can ask them later. The Computer Museum have done great work on that. So I cribbed this, I think, from the Computer Museum's website. It was the first commercial computer. You might get into arguments with some Germans who insist that Konrad Zuse was selling computers, but for some value of commercial. This was definitely a machine that was doing work for business in exchange for paid currency. It was saving the business money. Selling a machine for cash to a university, to academic research, maybe that's not commercial. It was, of course, built by J. Lyons Tea Rooms. And why is, you know, a shop that sells cream cakes really interested in the world's first business computer? You sell a lot of cakes, you've got a lot of calculations to do. You've got to buy the right number of meters of Swiss roll and so on. The design was based on EDSAC. We're talking about a machine with about 6,000 tubes, 1,200 relays. And it first ran the bakery values application in 1951. So pretty early as far as computers go. Um, by the time we get up to the Leo 3, the sort of master program, their word for an operating system, could run 12 different applications at once. So I think it's pretty interesting. So this, this I love this next piece. Rummaging through the archives, I found the uh, journal of the of automatic digital computation. I love that, from 1953. And uh, it's the text is small, so I'll read this to you. This is a, a copy from that report. An unusual feature, so you have to read this in, imagine in my head I'm giving you sort of clipped, received pronunciation, BBC tones from the 1950s. An unusual feature, which has been found valuable in fault finding, is a loudspeaker connected to a waveform in the central control circuits of the machine. This loudspeaker makes a noise depending on the sequence of orders being carried out and every large program has its own characteristic rhythm. Should the machine stop or go permanently into a closed loop, the fact is instantly apparent. In testing the machine on simple repetitive programs, a single failure is easily detected as a break or a click in the continuous tone. And I, for one, would like to take this opportunity to call for more audio-based software debugging. Um, we, I think it helps when your clock speed is basically down at audio frequency. And if I was to wire a speaker to the 
two and a half gigahertz processor in this laptop. I think that may be inaudible. However, I love the idea of not just looking at textual output um, and not even just looking at uh, visual output, but having some audio output as to what the program is doing. Even if it made a little, little bit every time it, um, I guess, you know, you see an IBM PC with a big old hard disk, you can hear the hard disk going, right? That is almost like a speaker connected to the central control circuits of the machine. And you can tell when it's making a bad sound because it sounds like it's doing the same thing again. You're like, mm, okay, hard disks aren't supposed to do that. Anyway, I just dug this out of the archives and I thought it was wonderful. We should all do more of this. So earlier, we saw the IBM System 360. It ran IBM System 360 operating system, also known as OS 360. Uh, so in 1964, um, software being late and bloated, it turns out is not a novel concept in software engineering. IBM had perfected the art of late and bloated software as early as 1964, and that's something I don't think they get enough credit for. Um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a mess. They sold people a bunch of machines that didn't have enough RAM. They told them it was enough RAM and it wasn't. So actually we, we ended up with a whole bunch of operating systems like basic operating system 360 or tape operating system 360 or disk operating system 360 with various levels of functionality squeezed into the resources of the machines they had sold. As I understand it, certainly not a th system 360 expert, maybe some of you here are, there are three versions of this operating system. The basic version only runs a single task. So it has a job to do and that's what it does. It's running the valuations application. Nothing else is gonna happen. The second version allows you to run multiple applications at once, but you must know in advance how many and what they are. So it's like building a computer that can definitely run Word and Excel at the same time, but it can only run Word and Excel and if you wanted two copies of Word, or you also wanted to run PowerPoint, tough. You've built a machine that only runs Word and Excel. I mean, I guess in business applications, that maybe that makes sense for you. The fancy version, the top end version, had this idea of variable tasks. And I think this is where we get to a computer in a machine you could walk up to and get it to do something. We really need the ability to add and remove applications while it's running, I think, for it to be a computer. So those basic system 360s had as little as 32K RAM. OS 360 really needs 128K. The variable tasks feature, I mean, even the fixed tasks feature is proved useful because processors were starting to outstrip the speed of their storage. And that meant when a computer needed something from storage, it had to wait. And a processor just, nothing to do or just, kick my heels, wait cycle after cycle until the disk is returned. Is there something more efficient you can do? Yes, you can tidy up all of the things you are working on and go and do something else. So the ability to run multiple tasks at one time is actually sort of a time-saving feature. Bakery valuations is stuck because I'm waiting for the tape to spool up or whatever it is. I can go and run something else in the meantime and then I can get all of this work done together faster than if I just did A followed by B followed by C. The operating system was written in assembler and they're, I believe, still compatible operating systems sold today. You can get ZOS on a, on a system 390X, has some sense of compatibility right back with these early machines. Um, Multics, so another example of a historic operating system. This one comes from MIT, General Electric, Bell Labs, we're a little bit later than, than the System 360, we're up to 1969 now. This was written for the General Electric 645 um, mainframe, uh, later uh, Honeywell system, I believe. Uh, interesting machine in that it has 36-bit words. We're so used to this idea of 32-bit computing now. We had 8-bit, we had 16-bit, we had 32-bit. We understand that and that makes sense because they just doubled with every generation. Well, no, back in 1969, we had 36-bit computers, they had 18-bit addresses and 18-bit segments. Um, sorry, historical curiosity. Multics is an interesting operating system in that it doesn't really distinguish between things that are on disk and things that are on RAM. It has this sort of idea of virtual addresses and you don't tell the operating system, please load this file and give me the bytes. You tell the operating system, please load this file 
and then let's pretend the contents of the file are available at these addresses in memory. And now when I want to read from the end of the file, I go and read from the addresses at the end. If I want to read from the middle of the file, I read from the addresses in the middle. And whichever addresses I read, the operating system goes and gets the files from disk. 1969, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool technology. It supports dynamic linking. We can assemble our applications out of multiple pieces at runtime, and we can swap the bits out on disk and load in different parts of our application. File system has some sense of hierarchy. We can have files that are within folders or directories. It's pretty cool, 1969. We even have this idea of a kernel space and a user space. So this is basically saying the operating system is divided into two lands. The land which is ruled by the kernel and the land which is ruled by the common folk, the applications. And the applications are not allowed to invade the kernel land because the applications are unwashed and untrustworthy. And so we must keep them to their own land and kernel gets to rule kernel space. And there's a very, very carefully guarded set of bridges and drawbridges and gates between the two because we don't want those great unwashed applications spoiling the kernel. 1969, pretty cool. And it was written in the programming language PLI, I think that's pronounced. I think you can still, almost certainly can still get systems that will run your PLI applications if for some reason in the last 50 years you haven't managed to rewrite them. Um, incidentally, it stands for the Multiplexed Information and Computing Service, Multix. Another operating system from history, which thankfully has gone away and we are not stuck with its terrible design decisions anymore. Ah, uh, wait, no. Unix from Bell Labs, 1969. Thompson and Ritchie et al, bless them, um, wrote a single tasking, non-portable operating system in assembler for the PDP-7 for the express purposes of playing space travel. They had a PDP-7 to hand, um, no software to run on it. Space travel was written to run on another computer. I'm assuming it was the, the Multic system they had access to. And it cost them about $85 in CPU time every time they wanted to play a game. It was a bit pricey. It's a solar system simulator. Now, well, this PDP-7 is spare. Let's just knock up basically enough operating system so we can now play space travel for free. And they gave their operating system the idea of processes, applications that can run next to each other, files on disk, which are not really files on disk, but they are actually magic portals to external hardware. Again, hierarchical file system. They were using Multics and they went, well, we'll just sort of do what that does, but we'll just do just enough so we can play space travel. Um, unfortunately, this lashed together operating system proved a bit useful um, and hence why it's stuck with us. Initially, someone wrote a text processing application called ROF um, and they were using it for processing patents. Um, and then it was ported to other machines and then eventually it was rewritten in this new programming language, C, they invented in 1973. Uh, ROF is of course still with us. Any Unix system now, load up a man page. If you've ever looked at the source code for a man page, it looks kind of weird and arcane it's because it's based off ROF, this sort of text processing system from the very early 70s. It's still with us and we'll see later Unix machines are still among us. The Unix family tree. This is the shortened and abridged version. There was Bell Labs Research Unix derived from that original version, version one through to version 10. Then we have AT&T System 3 and System 5. I do not know what happened to System 4. Maybe nobody does. AT&T's version of Unix got used by a number of very large Workstation manufacturers, so HP had called it HP UX, Silicon Graphics called it IRIX, IBM called it AIX, Sun's version was called Solaris. And these are all versions of, of AT&T um, System 3 or System 5. Then we have the Berkeley software distribution, which is sort of a separate branch on the family tree, which is where Sun's original Sun OS came from for the 68,000. It's where the BSDs come from that we still know and love today. NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, DragonflyBSD, GhostBSD. There's lots. The thing about open source software is if you don't like it, you can just 
copy it, make your own version, stick your own label on it. Um, next step was based on, in part on BSD. Next step is still with us because it's basically Mac OS. Mac OS is kind of next step, but with next step crossed out, Mac OS put on top. And initially some, some system uh, nine compatibility stuff. Microsoft had a Unix. It's sort of separate to all of the above. They called it Xenix. Xenix or Xenix? Let's go with Xenix. That sounds good. Uh, so here is the short version of the family tree. Yeah, Unix has had a big and complicated history. Go and search around on the internet for the history of Unix. And this only goes up to 2019. So 1969 to 2019. So this is 50 years of Unix history. And I'm quite sure it's going to keep going, going on. It's just there to play space travel. It's just another operating system from the archives. One that is sadly no longer with us. Digital research, intergalactic digital research. Control program for microcomputers or CPM. Uh, written for Intel machines with the 8080 processor, 1974 now. So a bit newer than that sort of Unix Multic stuff. Um, loads of machines ran this. I think this was the first example of a really portable operating system that got ported to lots of platforms. Again, you can have an argument in a bar as to whether Unix was a portable operating system and ran on more or less computers than CPM did when it came out. That'd be a good conversation to have. But CPM available on lots of machines. And we just, does anyone know offhand which Commodore machine it was ran CPM? It's the 128, had a Z80 on board. The C64 had a Z80 cartridge for running CPM and the cartridge didn't work on the early Commodore 128. So they just went, fine, we'll put the Z80 in it. Um, and it turns out it got them out of a hole anyway. So yeah, Commodore made some CPM machines. Excuse me, let me grab some water. So what do we need to run a CPM machine? Well, we need an ASCII terminal. So it's sort of a screen and a keyboard all in one, and it just speaks this ASCII protocol, um, these sort of basic 8-bit characters between your terminal and your computer. I think it's still a computer, even if you need a terminal plugged in, I'll let you have that. I would say a terminal is not a computer. It's more like a printer or a teletype, really. Teletype with a fancy visual display. So I'm going to let them have that. It's still a computer, even if you need a terminal plugged in. You need a floppy drive and only 16K of RAM. And this will be important for later. Really interesting design decision with CPM is it's an operating system in two parts. There is the basic input output system, which is the lowest part of CPM. And that's the bit that touches the hardware. And the operating itself is actually portable. It is the basic disk operating system, the BDOS, and then the command console processor, their equivalent of command.com, the shell that you type into. That's the sort of the upper bits. And by splitting the operating system in half, we get to keep common stuff, dealing with cylinders, head sectors, dealing with text input and output on the console. And then we get the computer specific stuff can go at the bottom how exactly do we get a byte into the serial port so it can go to the terminal? How do we get a byte out? How do we move the stepper motor for the floppy drive? That all lives in the BIOS, and then the operating system is this portable bit above. Uh, the file system is not hierarchical. Not everything in computing goes forward as time goes by. Sometimes you have to make some sacrifices. CPM doesn't have the concept of directories. There is just a disk, and it has files on it. Yes, I'm aware there are users on a CPM disk, um, but really it's not hierarchical. Uh, we have the tool PIP. PIP is obviously, as the name suggests, the tool for copying files around from one place to another. I assume PIP had a meaning. I don't know what PIP means. Um, Peripheral interchange program, I hear from the audience. There we go. Because of course, that's what you would call the copy routine. Um, it understands magic file names. So if you copy a file to con colon, then it knows you don't really want a file called con colon. What you want to do is to put the file onto the console. It's an interesting concept. It, uh, it is still causing problems today. Let's say that, foreshadowing. 
Uh, and if you look at the slides online, you can click the link and I've got an example of Turbo Pascal 3 running on my Commodore 128. Turbo Pascal 3 is a really good development environment. I mean, for, for machines with so little memory, um, yeah, it really is very powerful. PC-DOS slash MS-DOS. Yeah, originally on the IBM 5150, that computer we saw before, 1981, for the 16-bit, it's a 16-bit operating system, the 8088. Um, IBM had, as we said, Microsoft Basic in ROM, this tape interface, up to about 64K of RAM, may need an operating system to run on it. There's lots of apocryphal stories about how they went to CPM. For whatever reason, CPM was not their first choice. So instead they went to the people who were supplying them basic and said, have you got an operating system? And Microsoft, bless them, said, yes. Yes, we have an operating system for the PC. And then immediately went out and bought one because in fact they did not. So they bought 86 DOS from Seattle Computer Products. I think they might have even just bought all of Seattle Computer Products, can't remember. They didn't pay a lot for it. And then they went to IBM and said, look, ta-da, operating system, as we promised. Um, and the split, just like CPM, because 86 DOS is actually a sort of a CPM clone, uses the same kind of APIs. I think there were some lawsuits as to whether it actually involved copyright infringement. Um, I don't know if they were ever settled. They were settled in that they stopped arguing about it, but I don't know if it was ever ruled as to whether it was in fact copyright infringing. Probably one of those things where you just went, we're not gonna talk about this anymore, have some money. IBM do the BIOS and Microsoft are providing the disk operating system became so popular, it is now what we think of when we think of a DOS. Uh, who made the first PC compatible computer? Compact. I was gonna say, I, I thought someone might say Compaq. I reckon Columbia Data Products was first. Wasn't a very good PC compatible, wasn't terribly compatible, but I think that was the first attempt to reverse engineer the BIOS in a legal way, obviously. Um, and make a machine that could run DOS. I think Compaq did a better job shortly after. Um, Microsoft, legendary business acumen of Bill Gates, managed to retain the rights to sell MS-DOS to anyone else. Why would IBM worry about this? Because it's an operating system for the PC. I'm not gonna run this operating system on any other machine. Oh no, all of these PC clones have turned up and Microsoft will very happily sell you MS-DOS. Uh, CPM is pretty much doomed at this point. CPM was available for the IBM PC. That was the agreement. So, okay, fine. People can have CPM, CPM 86 for the 16-bit IBM PC. They just charged more for it than MS-DOS. So nobody bought it because MS-DOS was the cheap one and it was the one that was out first. So it was the one that had the software. PIP had this idea of CON as being a magic file. CPM uh, 86-DOS, MS-DOS 1.0 had the idea of CON as being a magic file, but it applied to any program, not just the copy program. Any program could access a file called CON and it wouldn't create a file called CON, it would go to the console. Which is why, even today, in the year of our Lord 2022, on a Windows 11 PC, probably even a Windows 11 PC running on ARM. There's a quick, I wanna go test that. You cannot make a file called CON because 40 years later, it's still a reserved file name. You can't even create a file called con.txt because con uh, works with any file extension. It also applies to aux, null, uh, lpt1. There's a whole bunch of reserved file names. They're still reserved even now. Uh, there was one other operating system that was available on the IBM PC very soon after launch, other than DOS. Another than CPM 86, if I say Niklaus Worth, does that mean anything to anyone? UCSD P system, a Pascal based virtual machine based operating system. Look into it, it's fabulous. Um, virtual machines, not a new thing. Other Microsoft operating systems, uh, and we talked about MS-DOS, uh, so they had their Xenix, Xenix, Unix, OS2. God, you could fill a whole 90 minute lecture just with what happened to OS2? Wow, things could have been really different. We had the 16-bit Windows, version one, version two, version three is probably the one most people remember. We went into the 32-bit Windows, 95, 98, Windows Me. And it is me, not ME. There are plenty of videos of Bill Gates at the time 
talking about how much he likes Windows Me. That is the official name. And then you get the 32-bit Windows NTs. Uh, terrible versioning. 3.1 is the first version of NT. Why is 3.1 the first version of NT? Why didn't they just start at NT version 1? Because regular Windows 3.1 was already on sale. And if they'd sold Windows NT 1, people would have gone, I don't want version 1, I want version 3. It sounds newer. So they just started the NT version numbering with where their regular 16-bit uh, Windows was at. Famously, their numbering goes off the rails in the middle. 3.1, 3.5, 2000 XP Vista, 7, 8, skip 9, 10, 11. And why do they skip 9? Because there's loads of applications that look at the Windows version number, and if it begins with a 9, they assume it's Windows 95 or Windows 98. And that software's still kicking around, so you can't make Windows version 9. That's why they jumped straight to 10. Now, I didn't warn people in advance. I have a video here. Let's save that for the end, because I think I'm going to have to jump on the Wi-Fi and, and do, some, do some shenanigans. This is... And I'm going to give you the opportunity to leave before I play it, because this is around three minutes of the most bum-squirmingly awful video you have ever seen, and you will be gnawing on your knuckles and praying for it to end. But it is an amazing glimpse into history all at the same time. And we'll save it at the end. Remind me at the end, you said you'd play the terrible video. I'll jump on the Wi-Fi and we will play the terrible video for you. Windows 1.0, in fact, the MS-DOS executive. The great thing about Windows 1.0 is the windows do not overlap. If you move them around, they bang into each other. It does not understand the concept of one window going behind the other. Wow, how far we've come. Uh, certainly, I mean, this is, uh, what's it say, 1985? So Mac OS system the Macintosh is already a thing at this point and just completely outclasses this, really. Windows NT, as I say, that's the branch that's really still with us today, released in 1993 is 3.1. It's a very portable operating system. It is available on these architectures. Which of these architectures was it developed on first and primarily? The answer is not x86, the answer is MIPS, because they wanted to make it portable. I heard that from Dave Plummer on his, uh, on his excellent YouTube channel. They had MIPS um, machines on their desk to do the Windows NT development. They ported it to x86 later because they wanted to prove they'd written a portable operating system. Uh, Deck Alpha, PowerPC, Itanium. Yeah, sad, you can do a whole 90 minute talk on what on earth happened there, goodness me. Uh, x86, 64, and finally, ARM. Very early risk architecture, but NT comes to ARM pretty late. Um, it's designed to be a very compatible operating system. So it can run OS2 applications, it could run POSIX applications, it could run 16-bit Windows applications, had these different various personalities built into it. Really, they've all gone away and we just have the Win32 personality these days. Developed by Dave Cutler and colleagues who came from working on VMS at Digital which is why there was a bit of a lawsuit because when they published the Windows NT reference manual, Digital picked it up and went, this is just the VMS reference manual, but you've changed the names of some of the functions, but they all look the same and they basically do the same thing. And Microsoft said, sorry, have some money and we'll put Windows NT on alpha. And they decided that that was fine, which is why Windows NT was available on alpha. And then DEC got bought by Compaq and Alpha got killed. And there's another sad story. Um, we haven't talked about Apple so far. I mentioned the Macintosh briefly. Brief history of the operating system at Apple. The Apple One doesn't have one. Basically, Apple II comes with a sort of a disk operating system and a basic. Uh, Lisa OS, I think, is fascinating. We don't talk about it enough because it was completely overshadowed by uh, the Macintosh operating system which came later. Um, so yeah, Macintosh is sort of a cut down version of the Lisa OS for a much more cut down, cheaper computer. Obviously it started out on Motorola 68K, got converted to PowerPC. Yeah, a really interesting history of Macintosh system. Uh, Mac OS X, Mac OS as it's now, 
is certified Unix. I don't know if the latest one on this ARM machine is certified Unix, but various versions in Mac OS X history have been stamped certified Unix. Um, that's, so you compare that to um, what Windows 1 looked like. We've got overlapping windows. It's black and white, but I, I think early system is pretty impressive. Let's talk about Commodore. The 8-bit machines all just ran Microsoft Basic, and they had a sort of a kernel in them, but there wasn't really a huge amount. The DOS didn't run on your Commodore computer. The DOS ran on the disk drive. Disk drive had its own processor, its own RAM. You just sent a message to the disk drive saying, open file X, and the disk drive came back and went, OK. And you said, go and get me 10 bytes from the start of file X, and the disk would do the cylinders, the heads and the sectors, and go and fetch the data, send it back and go, here you go. So it's interesting that the DOS and the application don't have to be in the same machine. I don't know, it's a really curious design. Uh, Amiga OS uh, delved a lot into, went down the rabbit hole with Amiga OS writing this presentation. I bought an Amiga 500 Plus, the motherboard is obviously dissolved. I bought a 500, uh, been playing around with early kickstarts, different versions of Workbench, but you had exec, the multitasking kernel, and then on top of that you had Amiga DOS, which was actually a port of the Cambridge University's Tripos operating system, ported to the 68000. Tripos had a sort of a message passing multi, um, multitasking kernel underneath it, which is why Amiga DOS ended up proving fairly straightforward to port to um, exec. If the Amiga had had memory management, it wouldn't have had Amiga DOS. It would have had Unix. But Unix needs a memory management unit, and the Amiga doesn't have one, so Tripos was the next best thing. Then the GUI is called various things, but the toolkit's really sort of called Intuition. Um, the UI might be called Workbench. Um, some of it's in ROM, some of it's on disk. It's a really curious thing. If you've not spent time with an Amiga system, go back to it, because it is at the same time familiar and yet completely alien. The Tripos-based command shell you get in Amiga DOS is a little bit like MS-DOS, but it predates it, and there's other stuff that's weird, and the way it processes command line arguments, it's fascinating. I really got into to Amiga OS. Sad that it's kind of not really with us. Can't go through a history computer without talking about Atari. We had briefly, yeah, there was an OS on the 8-bit machines. They had a disk operating system actually ran on the computer. We had TOS on the 16-bit machines, which had uh, Digital Research GEM desktop. They didn't go away after CPM. They developed um, GEM DOS and the GEM desktop. And then the 32-bit machines had Multitos. There's the GEM desktop. It does look quite a lot like early Macintosh system. Unsurprisingly, there was a lawsuit. Um, I think later versions of GEM, if I remember this right, the lawsuit-friendly versions, they have two windows on startup but you can't move and overlap with each other. Yeah, Apple might have gone, no, overlapping windows, that's our thing. Uh, so you just get two windows that you can't move, which is the gem you'll see on, I think there's a PC 1512 at the back of the museum. That's probably got gem on it, and you've got those two fixed panels. Um, but here, this is like early gem, movable windows. The computer museum, we're in Cambridge. We have to talk about Acorn. We had Moz, the machine operating system on the micro. Uh, which included the disk filing system and the incredible BBC Basic. We had RISC OS on the 32-bit machines. Arm fam uh, Acorn famously skipped the 16-bit era. They just dragged the 8-bit machines along until they developed their own chip and replaced it with the 32-bit Arm, which ran RISC OS with the advanced disk filing system. RISC OS is still a thing. I was at the exhibition today. I took my Raspberry Pi 400, amongst many other things. I went to Coventry. I set everything out on my exhibition table. I turned on my Raspberry Pi 400, expecting to boot Raspberry Pi Linux so I could do some live coding demos for the people at this embedded conference. I'd left the RISC OS SD card in it, which maybe I, if I just use it as digital signage, I could have gotten away with this. RISC OS doesn't support Wi-Fi, and I didn't have any Ethernet, and I couldn't get files onto the SD card to... So sadly, my one and only RISC OS SD card, I had to reformat this morning and wiped it, put Linux on it instead so I could use the machine all day long. Maybe tonight I will make amends and go and put RISC OS back on my Raspberry Pi 400. Uh, anyone want to guess which version of RISC OS this is? 
I think it's late, much later than that because it's got pretty high resolution, fancy icons, a decent bit of color depth. And with the monitor down here in the corner, I think this is five is what I'm going to go with. Uh, I don't think it's six. I think it's five. Random picture I found on the internet. It's a great operating system. Love the marble effect. I grew up with Acorn machines. Computers need a marble effect on the title, but it just looks classy, right? It just just looks like the Fitzwilliam Museum or something. It's great. Um, more uh, history of operating systems. Talk about Linux. Linux is not an operating system. I'm not going to. Well, actually, you. But Linux is a kernel. The operating system is really uh, GNU, which is an open source clone ripoff facsimile of Unix. The clue's in the name. GNU is not Unix. It's a Unix clone. Completely free um, software implementation, including a C compiler, library, shell utilities. That's really the operating system. Linux is the kernel. Um, but these days, nobody cares. And your Linux distribution is basically just a, a, a pick and mix of various bits and pieces. The display servers come from one place. The sound subsystems come from somewhere else. There's less and less GNU stuff in it. Um, but that's Linux. Okay, and that was a brief history of the operating system. We started with the Leo one, remember, and the master program, and we've come through to Atari, Commodore, Apple, Linux. So where are we today? Operating systems today. Commodore. Let's pull one out for Commodore. Sadly, no longer with us. The Digital Research CPM. Sadly, no longer with us. IBM, that's a bit harsh maybe crossing them out. I'm sure they would insist they have a very vibrant cloud services division. Certainly not really in the business of making personal or home computers. Um, classic Apple system OS slash, I, 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 it, has, it didn't really have a name. It was just Mac OS, it wasn't a Mac OS, it was Macintosh system, which is sort of a terrible name for not Mac system. Anyway. No longer with us, really, nor the Carbon APIs that were in early Mac OS X. We do still have, for better or for worse, Microsoft Windows NT with its Win32 API. And we have the Portable Operating System Standard Interface X. If anybody knows what the X in POSIX actually stands for, please let me know, because I can't work it out. But this is basically a way of standardizing all of the Unixes, Unices. They were all getting a bit weird, a bit different. So POSIX is the standard and that specifies how your Unix alike system should work. Um, uh, yeah, Mac OS is POSIX compliant. Your Linux distributions are POSIX compliant. Is your web browser an operating system? Can load applications in it. I mean, a modern web page is just an application. It happens to be written in JavaScript. I can boot a JavaScript implementation of a virtual PC emulator and boot Windows 95 in my web browser. Starting to feel really like it's an operating system. Um, yeah, another discussion you can have down the pub. So the main operating systems, Windows NT, it has this idea of kernel space and user space. The kernel API is private, it is secret, thou shalt not call it, unless apparently you're writing antivirus, which is why it breaks every time Windows does an update. Um, causes all kinds of problems. Thou shalt not touch the kernel API. You will only use Microsoft supplied libraries, which talk to the kernel on your behalf. We have executables, we have shared libraries, and our paths look like this very familiar form, a drive letter, single letter, a colon, backslashes as the directory separator. Yeah, this dates back from DOS 2. So DOS 2 is where they added directories to MS-DOS. And they'd already used the, uh, the Unix slash, the forward slash, as the command line argument option. So if you wanted to say some command and then give it an option, slash A, you used a slash for that. And so they didn't want to use that for the directory separator, so they just went, well, we'll just flip it the other way around. Q 40 years of absolute nightmarish interchange problems where when you write C code, would you specify your include paths with a forward slash or a backward slash? or from your point of view, a forward slash or a backward slash. Uh, yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, how neat a history could have been if Microsoft had just done it the same way round as Unix. Functions to talk to the operating system look like create file A. They like to use camel case, capital letters in front of words, and 
I could spend at least 90 minutes talking about the woe that is Unicode support in Microsoft operating systems. The short version is they jumped on Unicode too early. Their operating systems have two, pretty much two versions of every API function, one that takes ASCII, where the characters are eight bits long, and one that takes wide strings, which is sort of UTF-16, sort of, where the character units are 16 bits long, and they're incompatible. You can't give 8-bit values to a function that's expecting 16-bit values. It doesn't work. So the API is basically just duplicated, even to this day. Wild. Uh, POSIX, specifically Linuxy POSIXy systems, kernel space and user space, that's still a thing. The kernel API is public. Kernel is open source. I mean, it's just in a header file. You could look at it. Um, we use syscall instructions to talk to the kernel. There is a C library. It's basically optional. You can just talk to the kernel directly if you really want to. We don't call them DLLs. We call them shared objects. The paths are the Unixy way round, forward slashes, and functions date from the 70s. So they had short on memory and they like to keep things short. So the open function is called open. I think the, the function for making a file is called create because they couldn't afford the E. I don't know. It's from the 70s, man. Uh, Mac OS, POSIX, again, like Windows, the kernel API is private. You are supposed to use the static libraries. Otherwise, you know, it's pretty similar to, uh, to a Linux system. So what do these have in common? Well, they all provide operating um, APIs for dealing with the files on the disk, deal with the cylinders, heads, and sectors for you. So we can open a file, close a file, read and write, look in a directory, get a directory listing. These are things all operating systems provide. Operating systems provide APIs to start and stop programs, um, applications. We can start an application running. We can stop an application from running. Uh, operating systems all have some APIs for console handling. So this is applications that input and output text. Even now, Windows 11, you can fire up a console program and it will appear in a window. Lots of people now um, uh, used to using their console applications on Mac OS and Linux systems and Windows console subsystems actually got a lot better in the last few years. It had been stuck in a rut for really 30 years. They hadn't done much to it. It's now, um, now much better. Uh, we have APIs for graphics drawing windows, these rectangular boxes that we're now so familiar with, but didn't exist um, really until, I guess, Xerox Park invented them on the Alto. It's probably the first machine with a GUI on it, but it's not fundamental to being a computer. It's just a nice to have, really. Um, yeah, 2D, 3D, video. You could argue video APIs are kind of a common part of operating systems. Memory management, allocating and freeing memory, making sure applications have enough memory, what to do when you run out of memory. Networking, talking to other systems. The software objects we used to do this are called sockets. There was a, it's the Berkeley Sockets API. So I think it came from BSD, it came from Berkeley, certainly. Um, and that's the way we talk with other systems. Windows and POSIX basically have the same networking API, pretty much, um, which is kind of nice. Less work to do. Processes and threads. Processes have their own address space. Threads do not. That's common operating system APIs. They look different on the different operating systems, but we have the same kind of concepts. Locking and remote procedure calls. So now if I have multiple threads and multiple processes, how do I share data between them without corrupting my system? We need APIs for that. That's a common thing operating systems provide. Let's talk a little bit briefly about the difference between an API and an ABI. So an API is an application programming interface, and basically we mean source level compatibility. So this level, this level means there is a function and it has this name and it takes these arguments um, in this order, but that's all it says. And we then have to compile with a compiler and we have to use this um, same or compatible compilers on each side. So the compilers agree, okay, here is, a, here is a, uh, an argument and we agree about where the first, ar first argument goes. But APIs are compatible across multiple CPU architectures because as long as the two sides use the same compiler on the same platform, I can provide the same API on different systems. All we need to do is change our compiler and our source code has no changes. It's, it's source code compatible. The application binary interface says a lot more about 
where those arguments go specifically in a register or on the stack and in what order. Um, and uh, this is what you need for, for binary level compatibility. So if I want to run an application on computer A and on computer B, they both need to provide the same ABI. Because otherwise, if my application goes to call an operating system function and it puts three arguments on the stack and one in a register, and you go into the operating system and it takes three from the registers and one from the stack, it's going to crash. Um, generally, an ABI is defined around a single CPU architecture. ARM64 EC is fascinating. Very brief diversion into this, if you will, if you will let me. ARM64 EC is a Microsoft invention. The standard rules for ARM about where you put function arguments, either on the stack or in registers, are very different to the standard rules for where you would do that on an Intel chip. Windows on ARM therefore has a problem because lots of Windows on ARM isn't ARM code, it's still x86 code, x86-64 code, running in an emulator. So to speed up um, the use of this x86 code on ARM, they've changed the ARM ABI. They've invented a new one. And what this does, as I understand it, is it um, gets the compiler to put things in the stack and on registers in the same way you would on an Intel machine. The processor doesn't care because the machine code tells it where to fetch it from. But by arranging it on the stack and in registers in the same way that you would on an Intel chip, it means when you jump from ARM code into Intel code, you haven't got to sort of rebuild a new stack and make everything look Intel-like so all the Intel code will run. You can just jump from ARM world to Intel world, execute the instructions in a virtual machine, but you can still sort of point it at the, at the same piece of memory. Well, that was really clever. Dig into ARM64 EC. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, programming languages. So we need to program our application. We need to write the software somehow. And most uh, programming languages these days make some attempt to give you a portable API that exists over the top of the native one. So we don't generally deal with the, with the operating system native stuff. We use one of our favorite programming languages. The C++ standard template library, Python, Go, Rust. They all have these sort of higher level concepts of what a file is, um, how to read and write, networking, and then the operating system underneath, we largely don't care about. We also have curious things like Sigwin, which is an attempt to let you run, let you compile POSIX applications for Windows NT. Not ABI compatible, API compatible, it gives you POSIX APIs. You can compile your Unix programs for Windows NT. So that was a sort of a romp through history. We talked about what is a DOS, the history of the operating system, and where we are today with operating systems. So given all of that, given history is rich with operating systems, why have I attempted to write another one? Well, the reason I've done it is because I wanted to write just enough operating system. Now, operating systems are getting too big and so I wanted one that could just load applications, it's portable, I could run it on a, a bunch of different hardware, but that one person could understand. That is sort of the upper bound on the complexity I'm prepared to have in my operating system. If I can't remember all of it at the same time, it is too big. The Linux kernel is, I think, something like 25 million lines of source code, of which a large proportion is actually auto-generated header files for a specific type of AMD graphics processor. It's just mind-blowing complexity in the, in the Linux kernel. And I didn't want that. I wanted just, let's dial it right back. Let's understand what the pure essence of a computer is. You know, um, let's distill it right down. I wanted it to be open source and I wanted it to be open hardware. So I said, the operating system is too big. Um, yeah, operating system, they're just, there's too much and they've got all this historical baggage with them. You know, Mac OS and Linux still carrying uh, the weight of decisions made in early Unix in the early 1970s. Windows NT still carries the baggage of digital VMS because that's sort of what it was modeled after. So I thought, can we do something new, clean, fresh, small, light? That's the goal. 
When I get more work done, you can judge me as to whether I've met it. So, Neotron OS. There is a single address space. There is no kernel and user space. There's just flat address space. The OS API is public and is just available in the form of a jump table. So when your application starts, it gets given, here is a structure full of function pointers. This is how you may call the operating system stuff. And that allows me to move the operating system around when I recompile it, stuff grows, changes. You just give the application, here is jump table full of function pointers. This is how you may talk to me. If those function pointers do syscalls or software interrupts, that is an operating system specific decision. The application cares not. It just knows that function is for opening a file. I'm going to call it. We can load executables. There is no such thing as a dynamic library in my thing. There is just the application. Load it. If it fits in memory, great. If it doesn't fit in memory, tough. You can only run one executable at once. So there's nothing to share. Just when you're finished with your application, close it, load a different one. Part of this is in the name of simplicity, but also because my chosen processors don't have memory management units. And so actually it's then really tricky to, to load multiple applications in memory at once. The paths look like this. So instead of a drive letter, I've got a volume number because uh, I expect it may have multiple disks on there and disks may be partitioned. And I didn't want to really ape DOS. So what am I going to do with uh, aping Microsoft DOS? Reserve A and B for a floppy drive. I'm never going to have a floppy drive plugged in. And using an SD card as drive A just seems weird. So I've numbered my volumes um, and you can hot swap. Uh, I think you're going to be able to hot swap the SD cards. That's an interesting one because SD cards can be partitioned. DOS never supported the ejection of a partitioned drive. Floppy drives never had partitions. They were just drive A. Um, yeah, you can get you really get into the weeds with this stuff. But that's what a path looks like. I use Unix slashes as well because they are the one true slash. Um, the functions look like this. It's not actually a function you call, it's a function pointer as part of a structure. Here is open. Open takes a path, which is a string, and it takes a mode, which is a list of modes. Uh, you want to open the file read only, read write. And when we call it, what we get back is a result object. And result objects are a thing you have in Rust. I've had to make a special version um, details. A result object is interesting because it contains one of two things. It either has the thing you want or it has an error code. But you cannot access the thing you want until you have answered these questions three. No, until you have checked whether it's OK or error. And so it makes you do the check first. And that means it's impossible to get an error and pretend that you didn't because you cannot have the data until you've done the check. This is what Go gets wrong. Um, Rust gets it right. You have to do the check. So you're either going to get a file handle, a handle to the file you've just opened, or you're going to get an error, and then you can just report that to the user. So why am I not just building embedded systems? I'm an embedded systems engineer. I've built lots of embedded systems because it's a well-solved problem, and they're not general purpose, and I wanted to relive my childhood. You know, I like that nostalgia. I wanted to build, you know, an Acorn Archimedes, an Amiga 500, a Commodore 128. I thought, I want to have a go at doing that. Um, I built lots of embedded systems, but a computer, a machine, remember, that you can walk up to and get it to do something the designer did not envisage, that seems really exciting to me. I really hope I manage to get working machines I can put in front of people and go, have at it. What do you want to do? Write me a demo. Write me a game. That's going to be really exciting. Why did I make this an open system? Why am I telling you about it? Why am I not just sat in my room working by myself? And I'm sure there are a great many operating systems that were deeply fascinating where the author has just worked on it themselves, not told anyone about it. I have this naive hope that maybe I can make it last longer. If I share it, it will exist forever. Put it on GitHub, it feels like it should exist forever. I mean, at some point, Microsoft's going to stop wanting to pay for that. But for now, you put it on GitHub, it lives forever. I want to teach people. I love to teach people. That's why I'm a Rust trainer as well as a consultant. Um, and I want to share this, this journey I've been on. I want to talk about what is an operating system. Let's have that discussion about what these machines are that we spend our lives working on and using. Um, I'm not in it to make money. I give away all the designs. I might sell finished PCBs at some point, but the Gerbers just exist on my GitHub. You want to make 50 boards? Knock yourself out. I'd be really happy if you did that. 
So this kind of basic concept of a computer, well, I think I've distilled it down to the computer, some kind of keyboard, um, not going to build an iPad style touch interface, some kind of storage, it's going to be an SD card because they're so cheap, they're so available. It's just uh, a sensible choice. I want some kind of audio, probably better than blips and bloops, probably not going to use a synthesizer chip. So it's going to be more like, um, like uh, an Archimedes or early Macintosh. There's going to be some kind of wave output, this PCM samples. That's the idea for audio. If you want to do synthesized sounds, square waves, sawtooths, whatever, you can do that in software. We've got plenty of processor power. I don't need to remake you know, a Yamaha synthesizer chip. Playback samples, that will be fine. If I can input samples with a microphone, that'd be kind of cool too. And then some kind of visual display. I've chosen VGA video because it's still modern enough that I can get adapters and screens for it, but it's old enough that it's simple enough to generate with a microcontroller. So I'm gonna have file handling for that SD card. I'm gonna have console handling. So there's gonna be like a DOS style screen, we'll show you in a minute. We've got uh, columns and rows of text on a VGA screen. We're gonna have PS2 keyboard support. And we're gonna have basic memory management so your applications can allocate and free memory, but there's not gonna be a lot of it, to be honest. Uh, that machine over there has got 256K. I've built other machines with only 32K of RAM. It's not gonna have networking, maybe later. It's not a priority. I, we got away with machines that weren't connected for so long. IBM PCs were not connected until mid nineties. So it's fine. You wanna put something on it, just take the disc out, put it in your PC, copy the data. Maybe someone else will come along and go, I'm doing networking for you, that'd be nice. There's no processes and threads, there's just the application. If you want to write your own multi-threading engine and build it into your application, knock yourself out. There's no kernel space. You have complete access to the machine. Your operating system can stop my, your application can stop my operating system from running as the first thing it does. It's like how an Amiga game works. You boot an Amiga game, it goes, thank you very much. I'm taking over from here. I'm gonna talk straight to, straight to the metal. Uh, we don't need locks and remote procedure calls because there's no processes and threads. So, and, we, and we've covered this. Why am I doing it? Because I want uh, a small operating system. I don't care about what you have in your machine. I care about what I have in my machine. And the Linux kernel is so big because it cares about all of the machines. So I've taken a leaf out of the CPM book. There is a BIOS and an operating system. And the operating system is portable and is built against the BIOS APIs. And the BIOS is the thing that is specific to your machine. Um, I've written a BIOS for uh, the Raspberry Pi RP2040, which we will see. I've also written a BIOS, which is a command line, a, a graphical application even, that runs on Linux and Mac OS. So that is a BIOS in the sense that the operating system is happy to run on top of it, but it runs on a PC, which turns out to be useful for, for debugging. You could write a BIOS probably for an IBM PC. You could write a BIOS for you know, any kind of computer, really. The BIOS doesn't have to do much. The, the interface it provides to the operating system is really, um, talks about the interfaces, so it talks about SPI and I squared C interfaces. It talks about what kind of memory there is, and it talks about video memory, and it talks about human input devices. Um, that's about it, really. There's not a lot in there. And the applications, well, hopefully you will supply those. Um, so why did I choose to do it in Rust? Um, so I chose the Rust programming language because it offers this great mix of performance, developer experience, and a really great community. Um, I've done loads of other, other talks about the Rust programming language and, and what it can offer. Um, the short version is it's sort of like C, but with added reliability and developer productivity. And it's sort of like Python and JavaScript, but everything compiles down to machine code so it runs faster and there's no runtime and you can actually make an operating system out of it can't make an operating system out of Python because you've got the Python virtual machine underneath. You can make an operating system out of Rust because like C, like Pascal, it goes straight down to machine code. So if, you've not, if you're interested in Rust, you can ask me questions after. I've got loads of giveaways from the conference I was at earlier. Um, fascinating language, really. They've taken, they've looked back at the last 30, 40 years of programming language development and gone, let's not make any of those mistakes and they've come up with something really clean and nice. Um, 
It's kind of like what I'm trying to do with the, with the operating system. So and we talked about um, uh, sort of the, the binary interfaces between the BIOS and the DOS. In theory, the operating system should be portable, should run on any kind of BIOS. We have to use special kinds of functions in Rust because uh, Rust functions by default can only be called by code that was compiled with the same compiler because stuff about the binary layout changes from version to version, gives them great flexibility, but it means that everything has to be compiled at the same time. I didn't want that. I want a BIOS compiled, you know, three months ago to run an operating system from tomorrow. That's the portability goal. So we tell the Rust compiler, and the colors aren't great here, but there's a word at the top that says repra, R-E-P-R, brackets, C. And that means Rust compiler, stop mucking about, lay it out like a C compiler would. And then Rust stops mucking about, stops moving things, lays it out like a C compiler would. And if we do that on both sides, then everything's happy. But hopefully you get a sense here, Rust is a curly brackety programming language. It feels a little bit like C, but it sort of falls into that uncanny valley because there's weird stuff like the pointer we have, the star, I've marked it star const. So in Rust, we don't just have pointers. We have to say whether they are pointers to read-only things or pointers to things that may change. So the alternative is star mute for mutable. So there's a bunch of stuff you have to make explicit. More examples of source code. The red is, wow, utterly invisible on this projector. You can grab the slides after and, and, uh, and have a look through. This is a piece of code for the start of the operating system. It basically gets the BIOS APIs passed to it as a pointer. Uh, stores them in some global variables and then calls the version function and can print out this is the BIOS version. And you can see how you can then construct an operating system in these kind of terms. Anytime you want to do some hardware stuff, call the appropriate BIOS function. This code is a mess. This is what I actually should have written. Um, there's basically a bunch of details about how Rust accesses global variables that this is just kind of horrible and messy. It's much nicer if you make it all go away they do the same thing. Um, the way the BIOS talks to the operating system or the operating system talks to the BIOS is the same as the way the application talks to the DOS. There's a different set of functions, but they're presented in the same way. We get the same kind of portability. There's an OS API instead of a BIOS API. The OS API is given to your application at startup, and then you can write C code or Rust code, whatever you want. There's multiple different machines. There is a machine called the Neotron 32, which has a Texas Instruments processor. It's very similar to the Monotron system I've demonstrated previously. We only get 32K of RAM. The chip spends almost all of its time drawing the video. I was working on this quite happily, and then Raspberry Pi came along and released their latest microcontroller, the RP2040. Um, it is quite an astonishing thing. We saw the picture of it up front. $4 for the PCB, 75 cents for the chip. It absolutely smokes that TI chip. I've got two cores, and they run faster. 133 megahertz is the guaranteed minimum. Loads of them will run way faster than that. I've got eight times as much RAM available, and I've now got hardware to accelerate the video. So my old system was spending most of its time, the processor time, drawing the video pushing the pixels to the monitor. This system, I can stick them in RAM and then the hardware will just pull them out of RAM and send them out to the screen automatically on my behalf in the background. And I still have a whole second processor to convert characters to pixels. So like fine, it's a character A, okay, well that means I need an on and some background and then another on there. That all happens on core one. So it's way faster. So it's faster and it's cheaper and you can actually buy it in the middle of Chippergeddon. So the 2040 is, uh, is a, I think, a great choice for this project. And uh, what have we done? Well, as we can see here, I've made it micro ATX sized because I have interesting problems trying to find a case to put it in. I thought, well, if I just make it the same size as a PC motherboard, I can just stick it in a PC case. I've got loads of those kicking around. There's a little board management controller in the corner. It's all open source. It's a reusable design. That's going to implement keyboard controller and power control. So that does the soft on and off like you would have on an ATX case. Um, starts the system up, um, brings up the five volt supply, checks it's all good, then takes the rest of the system out of reset, blinks the power LEDs, stuff like that. 
<coughs> excuse me, extra serial ports. I wanted expandability, so this computer has a bus. PDPs have the Unibus, Z80 machines have the S100 bus, PCs have the ISA bus, I have the Neotron bus. It's not a parallel bus. I don't expose address and data pins because on a microcontroller, they don't come out. They all stay inside. <clears throat> and they're quite messy to root and they're quite high speed and it's all just a bit ugly. So instead, just use the serial peripheral interface. So we have four SPI pins, I squared C for an EEPROM, some EEPROM address lines and some power. But you can get a nice little, I think it's TE expansion slot. You can plug in cards. And this is what it looks like. So, turn it on. So I think power for the screen. And then there is just a power switch. That can just be the case switch. Um, and then if we just click that, it will boot up. The operating system boots first in 80 by 25 mode, jumps to the OS. The first thing the OS does is change the video mode to prove that you can. And all the OS is doing for the moment is testing the display by writing to video RAM. And the important thing is it gets to the bottom and scrolls. Didn't do that the first time I tried it. It just sort of smeared itself and made a mess. What the operating system is doing is putting characters into video RAM. And the BIOS in the background is taking them out of video RAM and sending them to the screen. So it shows the two pieces of software compiled separately, working together, sharing the RAM. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming today. I hope that was uh, interesting. I hope you enjoyed a sort of a romp through computing history. I hope maybe you think this isn't the worst idea in the world. There is some value in trying to not just recreate the past, but do something new, do something different. Um, so thank you very much. Happy to, uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So there is a microphone somewhere. So, so hands up. Who's, anyone got any questions? Are you... <coughs> There we go. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it does seem that it's every man for himself and every man and his dog could create an operating system. It doesn't seem to settle down to just one thing. So is it just like horses for courses? Yeah, so I guess as with all of these hobby projects, the, the author does it to serve their particular needs and their particular desires. And most of these projects, I guess, disappear because it turns out nobody else has the same needs. And if they do, their need is to write everything from scratch. So why am I going to pick up someone else's half finished work and work on it? Um, it's an interesting challenge. If that's as far as this project goes, honestly, I'm fine with that. I've had a load of fun with it and it will exist on GitHub. And maybe people will find it in the future and go, oh, I needed a, an SD card driver in Rust. I wrote one. I wrote a FAT32 file system in Rust. That's available as a reusable module. Loads of people have downloaded it. I wrote a keyboard driver in Rust. And again, this is one of the reasons why you would do it in Rust instead of in C. Rust is designed around these reusable elements of software. They're called crates because it's for moving software around. It's a terrible Rust pun. Um, I wrote a crate for a keyboard driver. So it understands scan code set one and scan code set two as emitted by an IBM PC keyboard because I needed it because I had a keyboard plugged into my system. I published it Later on, I noticed it's quite a few downloads. There was someone else in a completely different era writing an operating system for the PC. They were showing you basically how to boot an OS on a PC, how to start in real mode, jump to long mode, how VGA text mode work, just so you understand the basics of what Linux does when it, when it starts up, or Grub, or your bootloader. They needed keyboard support. They had the Intel keyboard, the 8042 keyboard controller comes in an IBM PC, it gives you codes in scan code set one format. And they looked in the Rust library of software and went, typed in keyboard, my software came up. Built for a completely different purpose, but it talks to PC keyboards. So they took it, they adapted it, they fixed up the scan code set one support. Someone else came along and went, that's great. I'm adding support for Spanish keyboard layouts. And someone else came along and went, oh, I'm gonna add support for German keyboard layouts. So collaboratively, we've then gone and built something that's more powerful, more useful to more people, but we were only able to do that because we did it collaboratively. So that's what I'm hoping, even if the operating system is a dead end, maybe I get fed up with it. Nobody else cares. Nobody wants CPM for ARM. It's a pointless idea. Maybe at least in the process of doing that, 
I learn something, maybe I help other people learn something, and maybe there's these little offshoots that live on longer and prove to be useful for other things. Can I ask another question? Please. Uh, uh, I've never heard of Rust before. Okay. So where can we find out more about this? When did it come about? Come and see What's me afterwards. I've, I've got giveaways. I've got little um, flies I can give away covered in, in URLs. The, the short story is it came from Mozilla. So there was a staff member at Mozilla um, had this idea of a new programming language. Mozilla found out about it, wanted to share it at work, and they went, that's really cool. We're writing an incredibly complicated and memory hungry, multi-threaded C++ application. It's called Firefox. Web browsers are phenomenally complicated and they have to be multi-threaded. Performance is critical, memory usage is critical. Doing this in C++ is hard. And Mozilla looked at this language um, that Graydon had written and went, we think we can use that for Firefox because that language looks like it solves some of our problems. So it has a lot more to say about the sharing of data between threads. It has a lot more to say about the size of buffers and whether you can store data or more data than fits in the buffer. At the buffer of size 10, I'm going to put 23 things in it. C compiler is perfectly happy with that. The Rust compiler is not. Your code will either be stopped at compile time or it will be checked at runtime and you will get uh, a panic and your program will stop. So they used Rust to rewrite various pieces of Firefox. Uh, I believe the Starsheet engine got rewritten in Firefox, the, the MPEG-4 header decoder. So various bits have been rewritten. Since then, it's an open source language. The compiler is open source. This is community that's grown around it. The community is super inclusive and super open and everyone really takes the time to make new people feel welcome because it's a new language. So everyone remembers what it's like to be a new person. So it's super inviting. Stack Overflow best loved language six years in a row because when people get over the technical hurdles of understanding Rust and the extra rules the compiler makes you follow, what they find is code that runs super fast, loads of cool stuff that they're used to from higher level languages, say, great development environment, a really inviting community, loads of brilliant open source material. So it's sort of expanded beyond Mozilla. Um, Mozilla, I think, maybe you can say they're struggling as a company. It's hard to know where a web browser vendor makes their money these days. Google do it because they need people on the internet to look at ads. Mozilla make a browser and their money comes from Google being the default search engine. So it just sends people to Google. I don't know, the web browsers are in a weird place at the moment. Um, but it's, it's grown, it's got this huge community behind it. There's now a big charitable foundation behind it which is backed by the likes of Microsoft and AWS or Amazon Web Services. Um, so it's got some big names who've looked into it and gone, yeah, this solves some problems we have. At the cloud scale, trimming your memory and your CPU usage saves you big bucks. So you're prepared to learn the new language to get everything to run faster, saves you money. Um, and with, with big support like that behind it, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's here to stay, whether it remains niche for embedded systems or whether we can convince more people actually it's a really viable alternative to C and C++ on embedded platforms remains to be seen. Lots of people have got existing C projects and they don't want to change. We understand that. C++ has had limited inroads. Um, Ada is a perfectly viable embedded language but not many people use it because again it's not C. But maybe Rust's C compatibilities will help it there. Maybe just the fact that it's a better language for dealing with untrusted input. We're talking about kernel and user space. Really the great divide these days is between what's on my computer and what's on everyone else's computers. And your computers are deeply untrustworthy and they give my computer input. They give it web pages. They give it all kinds of data and my computer has to deal with it. Dealing with that in C is difficult. And we've learnt mechanisms to cope with it, but it is fundamentally difficult to process JSON, a string-based format, in a language that doesn't understand strings. It understands pointers and null terminatedness, and you can put stuff in buffers that's too big to fit, and there's all kinds of ways you can get that wrong. And so I think Rust is, is gonna make inroads in sort of processing um, human-generated or external input, and I think from there it'll sort of, I think it's gonna start to move through embedded systems and people just go, actually, this is just a better way to make software because somebody started from scratch and they looked at the last 40 years and they went, let's do this better. So that's Rust in a nutshell. Uh, I've got takeaways so you can grab some stickers and grab some flyers and 
learn more about it. All the material is open source, it's all online. You can educate yourself as much or as little as you wish. Any other questions? Okay. So if I wanted to add some sockets onto here, wouldn't that imply like extending the BIOS layer or providing a driver layer or something like that? How would you yeah, go about that? So the, the idea is the, the Neotron slot system is based on the SPI bus and then there's a mechanism to do a chip select system to activate one specific slot at a time. So the BIOS is going to expose the SPI bus and a mechanism to activate the chip selects and then the drivers for the cards will go in the operating system. But if you like plugged in a card with two joystick ports on it, it's still kind of TBD as to how you would expose those joysticks to the application. Do I end up putting in like a human input device framework? I don't know. Maybe this thing is just going to spiral out of control and it starts off looking like Linux 0.1, but ends up looking like Linux of today, where it's 28 million lines of source code. Nobody knows what's going on. I don't know whether it's possible to keep it bounded, but the idea behind the expansion slots at least is the slot system is standardized and then the operating system doesn't have to care too much about the microcontroller specifics. A TI SPI peripheral is very different to a 2040 SPI peripheral. I can hide that, but ultimately it's still, please send these 15 bytes to the slot and then I will get these 25 bytes back. So that's sort of the, the level. One at the back. Yeah, pass you the microphone. Thank you. There's a Rust question. Did, did you write a custom memory allocator in Rust? Um, people have. I haven't. So the BIOS and the operating system on here are all completely static. They don't do memory allocation. The BIOS knows how big the memory is. The operating system doesn't. The operating system is portable. So it has to, the first thing it has to ask the BIOS is, how much memory do I have? Where is the top of memory? And so on. Um, when we get to running applications on the operating system, yes, there'll need to be a memory allocator there. There is one in the Rust standard library. It's quite big. Interesting questions about how much of that could we put in the operating system, which lives in Flash, and how much has to go in the application, which lives in RAM, because RAM is limited. So you use standard, not core? Uh, yes. So when you build embedded systems, there's two pieces of the embedded, uh, of the Rust library. There's libstandard, which is the big thing. It's got file systems and threads and sockets and it needs an operating system. And there's core, which is like the little smaller version of the library. It basically understands strings and results and not a huge amount more. And that's what you get on an embedded system. It would be nice as an end goal, maybe one day, applications built for this operating system get to use the big library. Maybe the operating system gets to be big enough that we can export file system APIs. We'll just stub out the thread stuff and the networking stuff, but file system APIs, and then I can write a program on Linux, I can run it on my Mac, and then I can run it on this, and it'll be the same program run in all three places. That will be a really cool place to get to. But there's a lot of work. I don't want to oversell it, I've had a lot of ideas and I've done some development and as you can see I've got video coming out on screen and I have a lot of documentation. There's a lot more software to do. It'll keep me busy for a long time to come. Have we done? Any other okay. questions? More questions. Now, won't we? <laughs> it's in fact perhaps not related to the operating system side of things but I remember on your previous Monotron talk mm -hmm. embedded Rust development was still fairly new at the time. You had to do a fair yep. amount of work to get it well, working. Yep. A few years later, has the lower end of embedded Rust pushed the boundaries any? Like, what's the low, lowest yeah, so hardware you could run this on? The, the problems we had with the early systems, it was sort of three or four years ago, were there are features in the compiler which are not considered stable. The features work. The problem is the compiler authors need to guarantee that these features will remain for years to come. They don't like breaking the compiler or taking things away. So there are a bunch of features you needed for embedded Rust, but they hadn't yet agreed precisely how they would work. And so you had to opt into like special magic mode to get the special new features. 
And in doing that, you promised that you understood that these features might be different tomorrow. That has been fixed. This is built entirely using stable, standard Rust. The standard compiler, you don't need any extra weird features. It all got added to the compiler. So it's moved on quite a lot in that sense in the last three or four years. Early versions of Monotron definitely had some serious funky stuff going on. This has managed to eschew almost all of that funky stuff. It does help that the processor is so damn fast. I don't have to worry quite so much about the optimizations because I have a whole second processor to deal with it. Monotron really pushed the boundaries of what that, that chip can do. Um, but yeah, that's progress for you. So do you think, um, you know, using Rust to write this, for this sort of discovery system, does it let you do things differently or better than if, you, if you'd written a, a DOS in C? What, what's, what's the yeah, advantage? I, I think the main difference is the collaboration. So when you do it in C, there's no standardized mechanism for sharing, for dividing your work into modules. You might agree that, okay, I'm going to have a thing called filesystem.c and filesystem.h, but there's no mechanism for sharing that with everyone. Whereas Rust has built in package management and dependency management and a publishing system. So I put the file system code in its own module. I called mine, uh, I think I called it SDMMC RS. And I typed cargo publish and it published it up to the server where all of the Rust software lives. And now it's available for anyone to use. And they can pull it down on their, on their 2040. They can pull it down on their TI system, on their ST system, on their Nordic system. You can run it on Linux against a file on your disk instead of a real SD card. So it exists. And now if anyone wants to do SD card stuff, there's a piece. So I think that's the key difference for me um, in using Rust instead of C. You could do all of this stuff technically in C, but you would end up quite insulated and isolated and siloed. And hopefully Rust is sort of more collegiate in how it encourages you to write your software. Can you hold your board up for us all to see? Please, when, when we're done, you can all, you can all crowd around the board and we can, we can talk you through it. And then it'll crash. Okay, if that's it, I think we should give Jonathan a round of applause. All right. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Has anyone, has anyone seen this before? Okay, T-Bone, time for some serious crunching. This is the short version. I'm using Windows, Windows, Windows 386. So all my applications are running at once. My report right now is scattered all over my disk. Oh, whoa, whoa, Windows, we'll pull these parts together real quick. I got pieces in one spreadsheet, I got pieces in another, I got pieces that have never been close to one another. Some are in the database, where things are pretty stuffy, some are in the word processor, that's where it gets fluffy. Whoa, 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 Windows, whoa, whoa, Windows, Windows 386. We'll pull these parts together and do it mighty quick. I'll cut and paste, cut and paste until it's in PageMaker, then I'll slick it up to be T Bone's Heartbreaker. It's not in time, there's no rhythm, the lyrics are awful. It's like the boss's nephew went, I can have a go at that. William! Linda! Uh-oh. These are one, two, three files. That doesn't look like one, two, three. It's not, na not. One, two, 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 three, but don't worry, William. Just hand the disk to me. I've got several applications looking mighty slick, running under windows. 386 in one of the windows. I've got one, two, 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 three running at the same time as the others. Can't you see? I can cut and paste your files into my report, or I can make them look better with Microsoft Chop. Choices, 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 what I got. Now I'm gonna show you how to make this thing work hot. Up in accounting, nothing ever looks hot.
I warned you. I honestly, it feels like something the boss's nephew cooked up, and apparently, a, a actual Windows 386 promotional video. The whole thing is about 12 minutes. They actually <laughs> used that as an advert. I, I, it's on YouTube. I don't know how far it got outside of Microsoft, but Microsoft made it. It's. Uh, I don't know. I haven't learned. It's been on. Yeah, there's only one copy, and it's not great quality. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think being in 4K would make it better, would it? Wouldn't, wouldn't fix the random offbeat Mission Impossible theme or the, the dog barks. They're just, look at this button on the keyboard. It's great. Woof, woof. <laughs> 